Hello, everybody. Can you can you hear me? No. <laughs> okay, I think I think you can hear me. Um, my name is Alesh. I'm from the from the packaging tools team in Fedora. Um, in the next 35 to 40 minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, DNS, um, which is a fork of YAN, uh, which is the standard uh, package management tool you have in Fedora. In case you're not familiar with YAM, uh, I will introduce YAM briefly. <coughs> Um, originally, I wanted to to tell you, since I, I had a similar presentation here one year ago uh, about what we are doing, uh, because that's when the project was starting. And originally, I wanted to tell you where we are now and then talk more about the future. But uh, yesterday, I realized that I still need to explain to people why we even attempted this radical move and forked, forked YAM. Um, I'll describe what the, what the issues with YAM we are facing. Um, next, I'll, I'll tell you what approach is, is that that the DNS is taking. Um, then I'll get to the point where I, where I speak about the current status of the project. Uh, there's packages in Fedora now. I'll, I'll tell you about, about them. And um, yeah, then, I'll, then I'll say what, what, what's happening to DNS in the future, what, what is planned next. So in, in Fedora, when you install, remove, uh, update, downgrade, uh, synchronize to new repositories uh, or new, new Fedora releases. When you do these package management operations, you, and you do them uh, <coughs> from, the, from the command line, which is the preferred way for, for m many people, um, you use YAM. That's, that's the, that's the go-to tool. Um, YAM has been around for a long time. It's got, uh, uh, it's got a command line interface that is uh, that you may be familiar with. Um, it's quite well documented, um, so so the end it's it's accessible for the end users. Uh, you can say that. If you if you want to extend it, um, you can use it. Uh, you can import it into into Python. You can import it uh, as a, as a module and then uh, then write your. Uh, your little packaging application on top of it. This is possible. Um, um, it's, it's implementing its own dip solver. Uh, a dip solver is a, is a crucial component in any package management system. That's, that's the kind of a component that um, when, you, when you decide you, want, you need to install package A, it's the, the component that tells you uh, you also need to upgrade this and download these other three packages. Uh, to make your original request uh, installable. And YAM has this, and it's got, it's got a lot more things than this. Actually, YAM, it's like, um, it's a bag, it's a, it's a bunch of functionality. It's, uh, it's really quite ambitious. It's, it's doing things like uh, downloading the, the repository metadata for you and taking care of your, of your groups. If you, if you want to install like, um, uh, a group for for development for uh, for uh, ex, uh, for the X environment, then you just install it as a whole group. Yam can handle that. Um, so the question the question uh, people are asking is is logical one. Uh, why not just stay with Yam? Um, and that's what I what I try to describe. Why not? Uh, <laughs> The first thing is, is in the API. Um, the API is written in Python, which is, which is a language that uh, uh, easy to use, easy to learn, 
Uh, there's many Fedora contributors who, who prefer Python or over other languages. Um, unfortunately, um, with YAM, Python is the only option. And there is a growing number of people who like to use Ruby. Uh, there are still people who prefer using C for performance reasons or other limitations. Um, and there's even, even people uh, doing packaging tools using uh, fancy functional languages. Like I think I've seen um, some tool written in Scheme or maybe Haskell. And when the, when the YAM API is, uh, is only accessible in Python, they just cannot use it and they need to re-implement things. Or uh, their only other alternative is to, is to embed Python, uh, Python in C code as a, um, as an in, uh, use, use the interpreter from the C code uh, and then run YAM through it, uh, which is not very sophisticated. Um, then even the people who who started using YAM or who are who are using YAM in their projects uh, through Python uh, often complain that it's lacking in documentation, that the API is, is not limited, and really the way for them to work with the API when they don't have the documentation is, is to open the source code of YAM and take a look what what classes uh, are there, what what methods they have and just, just use them, just use what they see. Um, and this means that basically everything that there was ever put into YAM, most of the objects, most of their methods, is a part of the API. And this creates a, a, like, a, like a nasty loop where, where the, the client code is using the YAM API but YAM has to respect whatever they whatever they are using, and because we know that they are sort of tend to use whatever they see, we are not able to refactor anything ever, or it's it's very difficult to deprecate things. Uh, that thing that you usually have with the other APIs, that at some point you decide to deprecate something and you keep it around for two two, two or three releases uh, with a warning to people. Uh, and then finally remove it. This is this is just not happening with YAM. So it, there's a lot of lot of code that that people still use. They they shouldn't have used it since five years ago. Um, this has the the very negative effect that it's it's not very pleasant to work with it, and it's also not simple to maintain it. And it's probably going to get worse. The other thing is, um, I mentioned that this is the only solver, uh, which is actually other, other problem, other inherent problem with YAM that we see today. It's written in Python, and again, it's it's not possible to reuse it if you're not writing an extension in Python. So, uh, right, and then we have components, uh, which, uh, for instance. RPM is an obvious one, which does uh, a similar thing. Uh, instead of, RPM doesn't need to do dependency resolving as such, but it does dependency checking, which is a V2 version of this. And it has to implement its own algorithm um, to perform this. And ideally, we would like to be able to have only one, one piece of code that does this. That, that does the, the dependency handling, the dependency resolving. Uh, this is inherently not possible when, when a part of it is in Python. Um, so, so we have to look into ways how to, how to remove this, how to, how to get rid of this obstacle. And at the same time, uh, when this project was starting, we became aware that there are pretty powerful um, and open source dependency solvers out there that, that we could maybe use and and get get the benefit of of them being tested and and being modern and and using 
exploiting some, some smart uh, computer science concepts. Um, now, I've said some bad things about the YAN API and about the YAN bit solver. And now I'm probably supposed to say that the CLI is bad as well, but actually that's, that's not what I think and that's not true. Uh, I kind of think that, that people are used to the YAM API, that it's, it's flexible enough, it allows them to do what they need. Uh, there's just, I don't think there is a reason to be changing this. There is, there, now and here and there, there are things that are, that leave something to be desired. Uh, but overall, the, the CLI is not a problem. Right, so what is the plan? Um, to describe it, uh, I first have to show you what the current um, uh, current stack of applications in packaging looks like at the moment. Uh, we have YAM, which is what the what the CLI users interact with, which is what Anaconda is using to as an extension to to install packages when you install the system. Um, it's got a plugins layer, so it's more or less extensible with new commands, with, uh, uh, with, with new options. And YAM holds all the functionality necessary to do this. Um, and when it comes to, to the proper installation of the packages, uh, it just hands them down to RPM. So it's just these two components doing, doing mostly everything. What I propose in this project and what I'm actually working on, what I've been working on for the past year is, is taking the, the functionalities in YAM out of it by one by one, uh, putting them into a cohesive pieces of functionality if possible and moving them below um, and, and into separate libraries that are written in C because for uh, for C, it's it's easy, or it's at least possible to be writing uh, to be writing bindings for other languages that people people might need. So so far, we of course have, have RPM. This is not changing. Um, I'm working on a on a small small library called Halsey. That is, that is doing the dependency solving and querying. Um, inside, Hoki is like a wrapper around, around Libsoft, which is what I was hinting about a few slides ago. Uh, the library we choose to, to do the, the heavy lifting of solving, uh, of, of uh, dependency resolving. Um, if, you, if you want to hear more about that, uh, the author is here and he's going to talk about it. In an after me in the in the next session. <coughs> um, a project is ongoing uh, that is building uh, um, a library to do all the all the metadata handling of yeah, like downloading the metadata from the mirrors, uh, making sure they are they are synchronized. Uh, in future. Probably doing this in parallel for for different repositories, um, and also downloading the packages themselves. Um, and another another project is ongoing that is creating a C library to do to do the comms handling uh, and the groups of, of packages and stuff like that. DNF. Is, is losing these pieces of functionality and instead is, um, is using them from, from, uh, from the libraries that are being built. Uh, it's still possible, of course, uh, to, to use, um, to, to write uh, high level extensions on, on top of DNF, just where you would previously import YAM in Python, you would just import DNF and the users will see DNF just like they use YAM now that is staying the same. But now it's also possible if you're using, uh, I don't know, you decide to 
to use Haskell to write your, your small packaging uh, tool. Uh, and you just need a, you just need a subset of the libraries. For instance, you 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 don't need downloading, or you know you won't be installing anything. You just need to do some uh, some querying on the packages, and you can just use the libraries directly, because now it's going to be possible to write these bindings for them. Um, let me now tell you what I think, what I consider the goal of this project. Uh, I want to get DNS in a shape where the users just don't feel the change uh, when they switch from the YAM to DNS, where, just, where the, the CLI just feels the same, the output looks the same, uh, they can use the same set of options. So th they don't need to learn new things. I don't think that I don't think we need this this move, and I don't think we need to bother users with um, uh, with with changes like that. Um, what is changing, and what what has to change, is the extensions API, because uh, many classes from from uh, YAM are being removed. Um, some of them that that should be deprecated ages ago are finally getting removed too. Um, I'm writing a comprehensive reference documentation for the API. So, so the API will be, will be set and limited and um, the new authors, the, 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 the writers of the extensions will have a place to go to and, and so they know how to, how to build what they need uh, instead of just browsing through the source code of, of DNS and trying to guess what, what objects they need to instantiate. It's, it's of course, if we want, if we want to move the old tools that, that use YAM now to DNS, uh, that, that's not going to happen magically. Um, I'm personally ready to be writing the, the, the basis at least of the, of the payload for Anaconda. Um, I'm ready to be helping with, uh, with, the, uh, with the transition in the other projects. Uh, and for some of these projects, it might make more sense to even start using the uh, the libraries below, di below directly, uh, and not not use <coughs> not use DNS as a whole. Um, I told you that YAM has a has a plugins API, and because I'm changing internals of YAM in DNS, uh, the plugins API is going to break as well. But that's not going to be, I hope this, this will not be as significant um, because the, the general, I, I sort of like the general idea of how the plugins work. So the plugins will not be having to change their architecture or, or similar. Well, and finally, once all the pieces are in place, once all the, all the all the extensions are migrated, or at least migratable, and we have the same set of plugins. Uh, DNS should replace YAM as the as the main uh, packaging tool in Fedora, and probably be called YAM again. Right. Um, <coughs> let me tell you about uh, how about what the status of the, of the package in, uh, in Fedora 18 is. Uh, it is available as what I like to call as a technical preview. Um, the basic set of functionalities is in there already. Uh, you can do installations and upgrading and distribution synchronization. And, uh, you can query for packages uh, using search and list. Um, There were some features I, I was going just to drop, uh, and then then the users appeared and, and told me that they actually use history and they use YamDB. Um, so the fancy features are missing, but the basics you need for, for managing your software on, on your Fedora, it's there. Uh, what I did is I 
I started writing the manual page again, and I'm only putting things in the manual page that are actually supported. So it's not like I, I fork the manual page and when you open it, it looks like the YAM page with half the commands not working. So if you, if you, want, to, if you want to start, uh, if you want to try using DNS, uh, then the best thing is probably to look at the manual page if, you, if you're worried it doesn't support what you actually need. And even better, if, if you find out that it's not working, uh, something, something essential is missing, then open a bugzilla, please. Um, previous year, I talked about what direction, uh, what, what, the, what the dependency piece, uh, what the dependency library piece below DNS is, is going to look like, look like, what kind of API is it going to have, um, I spent most of the last year working on this, and I think the API is, is slowly stabilizing. Um, I talked about having having a query interface that would sort of resemble the uh, manipulation with uh, with database objects in Django, the web framework. It's it's in there. It looks similar. Um, it feels similar. Uh, and the good news for me, at least, is that there's already projects that started using um, using Hawkey uh, to do to do some uh, stack engine searches. <coughs> if you're going to try DNS, uh, there are things that keep coming back, and I still haven't had time to fix them. Um, uh, one of them is that uh, this one actually I, I fixed two weeks ago, but you might you might still run into it with older versions of DNS. Um, is that YAM offers quite a rich way in which you can specify the package to be to do this operation on. Like you can use a name or name dash version or name <coughs> dot architecture. Um, this was probably the most bugzilla open against against DNS. Uh, complaining about this. This works now. The most serious problem, the most serious bug there is at the moment is probably about managing um, uh, multiple kernel packages. You see, YAM has this concept of being able to install uh, several kernel versions next to each other. So you have maybe, maybe three or four. And then when you install the fifth one, the oldest non-running kernel is removed. Um, the dependency solving library we use, Lipsoft, uh, which is used by another Linux distribution mainly, uh, in, in, which, in which they use, they use something different to, to handle the possibility to have multiple, uh, multiple kernels installed on one machine. And so the library doesn't support it. And I haven't had yet done the diving into Lipsol uh, to go and fix this. But on the other hand, uh, it will never remove your running kernel. Uh, and nobody has ever complained that, that this would break, that DNF would break his machine in this way or in any other way. Um, The most missed feature of YAM is probably the, the rollback of history. Um, and the, the loudest discussion is probably about how to, how to synchronize the metadata. Uh, this, has been, this has been always very, very visibly discussed with, uh, with YAM. Uh, that when you, when you start an operation in YAM and YAM thinks your uh, your repository metadata, uh, your package metadata is out of date. It just starts to to synchronize them, and users perceive this as very annoying because they just want to install one development library to to finish building their project, and instead, Yam takes maybe 30 seconds, maybe a minute to synchronize the metadata and to just tell them that they mistyped the name or something similar. 
Um, so since, since DNF is, is in, a, in, a, in a early stages <coughs> and it's a preview, uh, I experimented a bit and uh, I enabled an hourly job, a cron job, that, that regularly checks your metadata and synchronizes them with the mirrors uh, if needed. Most people didn't notice. Those who noticed uh, were happy with it. However, there is a there is a minority of users who are on a uh, they could be on a slow network or they could be on a network where the bandwidth is expensive, and who perceive this as a, uh, as a negative feature. It's very hard to get this right because like I said, the major it's beneficial for the majority of people. Um, what I think is the correct solution is to be able uh, in our fancy desktop environments just to, uh, in network manager, just to select what networks uh, do you allow DNF to be making these kind of operations on. No, right. Uh, I think there should be a checkbox with each network where you can where you can uh, where you can choose it. Uh, Wouldn't you say as well ninety percent of the problem if you at least would start by that's something that Jeff is managing at least to tell me that when you don't want to do it again with two T connections. Yes. Because in most countries yes. two T connections are you take your megabyte and Wi Fi and <coughs> wire yep. connection. That's exa that was exactly what I was hoping the discussion would go to uh, with the network manager people. That some networks are just naturally not good at this and you probably shouldn't use your mobile phone connection for this. However, when you plug in the cable, it's usually very cheap. So this would be a basic basic distinction. Uh, and then you can use the advanced settings and, and check the checkbox. Yeah. And you can you can do it with this and other other custom operations in one network. You're right. It's 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 one of the options. Uh, it's in the end it's up to the network manager people how how they decide we do this. Uh, I just like to say that there could be there could be more operations like this. It's not very typical that you need to do something um, something like this, but there is other applications that synchronize data. It could be. Uh, it could be even your email, it could be your backup script, <laughs> it, it could be, I can imagine more things doing this. Uh, another question, if that happens by Chrome every hour, how, how much load does it put on the server side? Because we had problems with that with our exam in the beginning, uh, Fedora, Mirror, so if all, yep. all you have thousands, hundreds of thousands of devices all um, to control the same power setting with. Unless, unless the metadata expired and we can set for each repository when it even ex expired, then nothing even happens. It just very quickly checks that yeah, this is not even expired yet. So, but yeah, so only if it's expired. Then so when it's expired, we, we first we check at that few kilobytes. <coughs> we check if there's a newer version. Then we will again expire yeah, after the same time. Uh, across the hours, and you have like hundred thousand to one million devices setting orders, and even a couple of kilobytes. Yeah, they have some ran random problems as well. Yeah. Another thing with this that this is going to be migrate, migrated from the cron job to the to the systemd service timer. Yeah, but we don't like cron jobs anymore. Yeah. Not the <laughs> early ones. Okay, I just need to be moving with this. So, so we can maybe discuss this later, or or just just. Comment on the bugzillas. Um, all in all, I was <coughs> I was not badly surprised by the amount of bugs. It's it's not so many of them, and and at the same time, many of them are duplicates, which means the reason is not that nobody is using it. Uh, 
So where is where is DNF heading now in the next upcoming federal releases? Um, first of all, I would like to integrate more of the red boxes, um, which I showed on the on the diagram, into DNF at least those that exist, and get rid of get rid of, of some more old legacy YAM code. Uh, at the same time, um, start more on the specification of the API. So by Fedora 20, hopefully, I'll be able to put out um, a modified experimental images, uh, boot images with Anaconda, using which uh, a user should be able to install the entire system just through DNF uh, and not using YAM as it is now. Um, Also around Fedora 20, uh, the API for plugins sh should start to take shape. Um, then in Fedora 21, uh, which is around the time I expect uh, many Python components will finally start moving to Python 3. Uh, I'll probably make the transition as well. Um, and then hopefully by Fedora 22, uh, DNF should be in a shape to to take over in Fedora um, and, and become the, the new main main package manager. <coughs> Sorry? Yeah. It, for me, it, lo it looks like very quick. <laughs> Yes, yes, this is possibly an Anaconda. This is Anaconda. Yes, uh, there's going to be talk on Anaconda in the afternoon, which I will invite you to. But since I used to work on Anaconda before, uh, yes, this is possible. Uh, it's called a quick start. But inside, uh, Anaconda will use, uh, you know, whatever payload, they call it payload, like YAM or Live CD, they have available to, to perform this. Even once this is finished, <coughs> there is still more things to be to be doing um, on the on this on the package manager. One discussion that keeps going, I already started a bit about that, is about the metadata synchronization. Um, when I started DNF, some people came to me and they said they hope that DNF is going to be a lot faster than YAM. Um, I think that the situation is that what people perceive as slowness of YAM is actually that waiting for the for the metadata to synchronize because because then we are talking about two or three seconds more or less, but the synchronization of metadata can take minutes in the worst cases. Um, YAM has the approach to do this on demand. Uh, DNF does this regularly unless you turn it off. Then it then it becomes the same as YAM. What we often hear um, is, is the suggestion, why don't you do it like, like Debian, where a Debian packager never synchronizes the data by itself, uh, only when the user tells it to. And so when you just want to install a package, you just type the name, uh, there is some old version of metadata, but it, then it doesn't matter because um, the the <coughs> even if it's an old version, the packager just goes and installs the old version for you. In Fedora world, this is not possible because our infrastructure, our mirrors, work in a way that they remove packages that are too old. So if your if your metadata is old, it's possible that the dev solver will find packages to install that are not not on the servers anymore. Uh, so you would end up by downloading the, the metadata anyway and and then then doing the depth solving again and then trying to download the, the packages again. Um, 
a bug was open that we can at least, and it, it's an interesting thing to at least think about, that we could in the least try this uh, because the depth solving phase itself doesn't take as much time. And only if it fails, then, then do the download. At the same time, uh, there is a project ongoing uh, where, uh, where basically people are trying to figure out a smart format um, to, to download metadata in deltas or, or diffs or something like that. And it, this is surprisingly difficult thing to get right. Obviously, the Debian infrastructure people chose um, chose to go with with uh, bigger bigger drives and less bandwidth. And the Fedora infrastructure people think it's better to to give more bandwidth and keep less packages on the server. Uh, it's got some other implications, like that. On average, you tend to get more updated packages with Fedora. Uh, I don't I don't really know what what these decisions are, but we will certainly need to work with, with them to, to, to fix this properly and maybe even reverse some of their decisions or try to find common ground. Right, so that was pretty much it. Uh, what I would like to tell you, uh, what I would like you to remember from, from my talk is um, is that DNS is, is a fork version of YAM, uh, the main package manager, which doesn't have any, any visible big problems at the moment, but there is underlying inherent problems that we should be, we should be looking into how to fix them. That DNS is hopefully an answer for these shortcomings. Um, that there are libraries becoming available in Fedora which you can use for different aspects of package management to write your own extensions or applications. Um, that the DNF is trying to, on the command line level, is trying to act just like YAM. Uh, I, I was careful not to say 100% uh, compatibility. That's, that's hardly possible and that would leave no space to, to fix things maybe that should be fixed. Um, the API is changing, but I hope it's changing for the better uh, by having a better specification, by having documentation, uh, by being more succinct. Uh, and also, it's, it's of course going to follow the, the proper uh, deprecation cycles if, if this is needed. Uh, and it's in Fedora now, and I invite you to, to try it out. Uh, thank you, and we can, we can discuss things now. Yes, yes. Um, I made before before we internally in the team settled on on using split solve. Uh, we tried to see how how much memory does YAM consume uh, to install uh, three thousand packages on a on a system that has one thousand packages, two thousand packages, and ten thousand packages, versus uh, how much how much memory it is when you use uh, zip, which is which is the the you know the stack in, in the other distribution. I, I just I just no no sorry. I just I was just told this Thursday that I am not allowed to tell to talk about the competitors <laughs> on the DevCon. <laughs> And, and so the result of this, of this measurement was that um, with the small sets, they're basically the same. <coughs> uh, 
I think, I think with Lipsoft it was around 60 megabytes of memory, and with YAM it was uh, around 120. But then when the, when the set was growing, the number of packages, then YAM could get over 200 megabytes easily. And zip, 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 zip would stay pretty much the same. So there is, there is a reason to believe that we will, we will s save some memory. Yeah, but it's not, um, it's not just the dip solver uh, that is taking the memory. It's also the other components in, in YAM, and they will be replaced later. It should have some tutorials. Uh, with the YAM, you get only the tutorials from the from the YAM wiki, but no reference. And I think that the reference is like the, the more fundamental piece of the documentation. In best so case, so if so you, you, you should, in best case, there should be both. I agree. Yeah. Uh, yes. I, I watch what is happening with the AM, but there is no regular process of, of bringing the patches back. Uh, since I'm trying to move it forward as quickly as I can, but at some point I'm going to have to go through the backlog and, and see, see what pieces actually need to be merged uh, back into DNS. Uh, the thing also is, if I remove or once, once the, the, the whole code that uh, does the metadata synchronization is removed in favor of bib repo, I don't have to be moving the, the fixes there. And also, uh, the two code bases are already in a, are already so different that I think 80% of the, of the commits couldn't be merged automatically. I didn't say it, it's a problem. I just said it handles it differently, and, and it just doesn't work in Fedora as well. Okay. Yeah, sorry. No point for me to go back to the compatibility. Um, no, this is this is not compatible with YAM. Um, I don't want to talk about Lipsoft too much because it's it's the next session, but. Uh, Okay, but it's today. <laughs> oh, okay, I was thinking that you're going to talk about lip stuff. <laughs> Oops. Um, lip soft can be built with, with different switches and there is just like a switch, like like build it so, so it fits Fedora the best. Like build it so it does what they expect in Fedora. And that Yeah. Like I said, I, I would I need to go go in there and, and learn how it works and fix it. I 
I just just a note. I just don't see see that happening. That the that the software will look at the time where you decided to install it. It just looks at the version number. Oh, the, we should. <laughs> okay, then we should discuss it. I was thinking that this typically should be should be done. <laughs> sure. Uh, and I'm out of time now. So thanks.